Cartelera del Colegio Nacional. En vivo. Organismos constitucionales autónomos. El manto de la tierra. Presentación editorial. Ensayos reunidos. 1984-1998. Las grandes piedras de la prehistoria. Temas pendientes en cuidados paliativos. La educación superior, las grandes instituciones nacionales. Y además te recomendamos. De la gran explosión al surgimiento de las civilizaciones. Del 22 al 27 de febrero. El Colegio Nacional te invita.
muy buenas tardes. A nombre del de Consorcio de Universidades por la Ciencia, de Fundación UNAM, Colegio Nacional y el conjunto de instituciones en México y en el extranjero, les agradecemos el interés en este ciclo de conferencias y, eh, que nos, eh, nos acompañan. El día de hoy tenemos una conferencia muy especial sobre eh, el interior de la Tierra. Eh, la parte del de mando, que es la mayor parte de nuestro planeta, y en donde se dan los procesos que ocasionan las eh, erupciones volcánicas, eh, los temblores, y que hacen que nuestro planeta sea un planeta muy, muy activo. Eh, la conferencia está dada a cargo de la doctora eh, Bárbara Romanovics, que es eh, profesora en la Universidad de California, en Berkeley, y es también eh, profesora en el Instituto de Física del Globo en París y es eh, miembro del de Colegio de, de Francia. Eh, eh, thanks, eh, Barbara, for accepting the invitation. It's a real eh, pleasure and an honor eh, having you eh, here. Yeah. And uh, eh, eh, this eh, eh, seminar cycle eh, is eh, on research eh, projects, eh, research studies, And uh, this is the main characteristic uh, uh, of uh, the uh, this uh, of this uh, program. We are presenting uh, what uh, is uh, being uh, done in uh, science and uh, technological uh, development. Uh, the uh, seminar cycle is organized uh, by a group of universities uh, in uh, Mexico, the U.S., uh, France, uh, Spain, uh, U.K., uh, Brazil, and uh, is a part of a very large uh, network and uh, is uh, supported by the uh, UNAM Foundation and the, uh, co the, the Colegio uh, Nacional. Um, uh, we, uh, es, tenemos el placer de que nos acompañen el presidente de Fundación UNAM, el licenciado Dionisio Mid, y la doctora uh, Valerie Barbosa, uh, quien es uh, la uh, encargada de la colaboración científica en la Embajada de Francia en México. Eh, la colaboración con la Embajada es extremadamente importante y nos ha permitido tener un contacto eh, muy interesante y muy directo con eh, las instituciones de educación superior y de investigación en, en, en Francia. Eh, 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 Dr. Eh, Barbara de Romanovics is eh, a professor in the University of California in Berkeley, and eh, she has eh, a very interesting eh, academic eh, background. Eh, she has eh, studied eh, applied mathematics, eh, astronomy, geophysics, eh, and eh, has a doctorate, doctorate eh, degree in the University of Paris and the do doctorado de Estado in the University of Paris. And uh, has uh, received uh, uh, the most prestigious uh, awards in Earth Sciences, uh, in Earth and Planetary Sciences, including the uh, Begner uh, Medal from the European Geosciences uh, Union, uh, the uh, uh, Fellowships uh, from the American Geophysical Union, the International Union of uh, Geodesy and uh, Geophysics, is a member of the Academy of Sciences in the U.S. and uh, uh, she has specialized uh, in uh, how the interior of our planet uh, works. Uh, she has uh, developed uh, some of the most uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, numerical models uh, for understanding the interior of the planet, how it works, uh, how uh, we have uh, this uh, connection on the surface with the volcanic eruptions, uh, the earthquakes, so it's a and we, are, we feel be really very honored that uh, Barbara has accepted to present uh, the uh, studies uh, she is uh, doing. Uh, she has uh, a very strong uh, group, uh, research uh, group in uh, France and the US, and uh, well, it's actually an international, an international group. Um, uh, durante la presentación, uh, uh, tenemos uh, tiempo para preguntas, las pueden hacer por diferentes plataformas. Y eh, le eh, voy a pasar eh, la palabra al eh, presidente de Fundación UNAM, eh, Dionisio Mid, y después eh, a eh, la doctora eh, Valerie eh, Barbosa, eh, quien eh, nos eh, dirán unas palabras y sobre todo la importancia que reviste eh, la 
ciencia y la tecnología para el desarrollo de nuestros países. Y eh, con eh, eh, Francia tenemos una, eh, además de una estrecha amistad y un largo y, y muy rico eh, legado, tenemos eh, este, una multitud enorme de proyectos y de estudios que se hacen en todos lados. Eh, eh, muchas gracias y le pasamos la palabra al licenciado Dionisio Lira. Muchas gracias, Jaime. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Es otra vez un privilegio estar con ustedes en esta jornada en donde hoy hablaremos nuevamente de nuestro planeta Tierra. Agradecemos la presencia de la doctora Bárbara Romanovich, de, de, de la doctora Valery de, de Embajada de Francia, y confirme el acierto de haber constituido este consorcio de universidades por la ciencia. Justamente hemos, eh, en otras ocasiones, hecho referencia a que la pandemia trajo consigo muchos desafíos y muchas limitaciones, pero estas no fueron suficientes para bloquear la capacidad, la inventiva y el deseo de superación de la investigación científica y tecnológica. Y esa respuesta en este caso ha sido a través de los consorcios por la ciencia, que originalmente a través de 14 universidades, yo ya más de 20, pues se ha venido enlazando para tratar de compartir conocimiento, de compartir interés, de compartir en los estudiantes y en los profesores este ánimo de superación por conocer cada vez más los problemas de la ciencia. Una de las lecciones que también nos ha dejado la pandemia, uno de los eh, elementos que ha traído también consigo, aparte de estas capacidades de comunicación que hoy tenemos enfrente, pues es justamente la de conocer mejor nuestro planeta. Y yo creo, alguien, perdón, alguien tiene su teléfono, digo su micrófono encendido y hay resonancia. Entonces, yo creo que, que es muy, muy importante que cobremos conciencia de que tenemos que cuidar nuestro planeta. Y en estas investigaciones en curso, estamos aprendiendo a conocerlo mejor. Y eso yo creo que es eh, algo que tenemos que ponderar mucho. Nuestro planeta es un planeta vivo. Hemos visto cómo se va comportando, cómo se va modificando, cómo se va generando nuevos perfiles y nuevos comportamientos a través de la historia y cómo el hombre, a pesar de su presencia tan reciente y tan joven en nuestro planeta, pues ha venido incidiendo también en parte del comportamiento que hoy tenemos enfrente. Algunos para bien y otros para mal. Y yo creo que, por ejemplo, los temas del cambio climático, pues son sin duda algunos de los desafíos que hoy todavía tenemos enfrente. Esta inquietud del hombre por cierto, no se ha agotado ya en el planeta Tierra. Hoy tenemos también una presencia en Marte, a donde queremos conocer también qué está pasando, cómo se gestó este origen de nuestro universo. Y esto obedece, pues, a esta inquietud, a este interés y a esta respuesta que busca el hombre para proteger nuestra casa común. Hoy celebramos la presencia de Valerí, que también significa también dentro de nuestro consorcio otro rostro amable para conversarnos, lo que significa también este esfuerzo por impulsar la tecnología y el desarrollo científico. Queremos subrayar nuestro, nuestra gratitud nuevamente al doctor Jaime Rutia, desde el Colegio Nacional, desde la Junta de Gobierno de la Universidad y desde nuestro propio consejo en la Fundación, pues ha sido un impulsor de este intercambio, de esta capacidad de y ha estado detrás también de este consorcio que ahora estamos eh, potenciando y que está significando desde nuestro punto de vista un esfuerzo inédito para tratar de potenciar estas capacidades de intercambio entre las distintas universidades. Esto es respuesta, creemos nosotros, de este nuevo mundo que se está imponiendo ya. Después de la pandemia el mundo no será igual, el mundo será diferente y este mundo del futuro se está sembrando ya a través de estas capacidades, a través de estas actividades y a través de este intercambio en donde se suma el conocimiento, en donde se suma la investigación y en donde se comparte lo que se está conociendo. Con algo muy singular, estas presentaciones recogen investigaciones en curso, de manera que quienes tengan la oportunidad de participar y nosotros nos beneficiamos de estas presentaciones, ahora de la doctora Romanovic, 
justamente es lo que se está estudiando, lo que se está avanzando y tiene la generosidad y la capacidad de compartirnos este conocimiento. Lo agradecemos sinceramente y yo creo que a través de este esfuerzo, a través de estas pláticas, habremos de, de, de cobrar conciencia la necesidad de cuidar cada vez nuestro planeta, cada vez más, porque es nuestra casa común. Bienvenida, doctora, gracias por su presentación. Bienvenida, Valerín, gracias por la presentación. Gracias de nuevo, Jaime, por darnos esta oportunidad. Buenas tardes a todos y es con el mayor interés de escuchar esta presentación. Este, muy, muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos los que nos están viendo. Antes que nada, pues quisiera agradecerle muchísimo a los organizadores de este evento, y en particular a la Fundación UNAM, a la UNAM y al Colegio Nacional, por su invitación a participar en el mismo. Eh, para los que no conocen muy bien esta institución, el Collège de France es una institución pública que cumple desde el siglo XVI, digamos con dos misiones, que son sumamente importantes y complementarias. Por un lado, se trata de impulsar el desarrollo de una investigación científica atrevida o, como diríamos ahora, disruptiva, y al mismo tiempo contribuir pues, a su transmisión y a la enseñanza de todos los resultados eh, y de los conocimientos que ahí se generan. El, co el Colegio de Fonds está organizado en cátedras y cumple un muy amplio espectro de disciplinas, va desde la física, geofísica, antropología, biología, eh, literatura, filosofía. Eh, esta institución es importante, en, en, en mi parecer, en todo caso, porque defiende muchísimo esta libertad tan importante que es la libertad de investigación, que es la libertad de, de investigar, de conocer, de descubrir, y también promueve el debate y la confrontación de ideas y de conocimientos. El aspecto, pues también sumamente internacional que tiene el Collège de France, contribuye en gran medida a la riqueza, creo, y a la intensidad de este intercambio. Y la relación tan fértil que mencionaban, eh, pues, por sobre todo Dionisio, que también platicamos con Jaime, que existe entre el Colegio de Fonds y el Colegio Nacional, es un reflejo realmente de la gran tradición de colaboración científica que existe entre Francia y entre México. Eh, por decirles algunas palabras, eh, esta cooperación es muy dinámica, una muestra, Francia es el tercer socio, digamos, de México en lo que se refiere a publicaciones internacionales. Entre 2009 y 2018 fueron casi 10.000 publicaciones, eh, se desarrollan más cada año, en el 2018 hubieron 1.200 y abarcaron campos tan diversos como astronomía, eh, matemáticas, biología molecular, informática. Esta cooperación bilateral está afortunadamente respaldada por eh, instrumentos, herramientas que contribuyen a estructurarla. Quiero mencionar tres de ellos. Eh, uno de ellos es el programa ECOSNOR, que cumple ahora 27 años de existencia, que ha permitido la formación de, de cientos de estudiantes de, de doctorado, la publicación de cientos de artículos eh, conjuntos. También existen las estructuras mixtas conjuntas de investigación, las UMI, las LMI, que ahora se llaman International Research Labs o International Research Programs, y que incluyen a instituciones tan importantes como el CNRS, el IRD, el INSERM, y por la parte mexicana, la UNAM, al IPN, al CINDESTAD, y muchas más que, que no voy a citar eh, individualmente. Y también quiero mencionar el programa de becas con ACID, que le permite a estudiantes mexicanos realizar estudios de doctorado en Francia eh, cada año. Eh, quisiera también terminar citando el Foro Franco-Mexicano de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación. Su última edición fue en el 2018 en San Luis Potosí y es un encuentro importante porque nos permite elaborar juntos una hoja de ruta que define algunas de las prioridades, eh, pues al menos temáticas, que nos gustaría realizar juntos. De manera un poquito más reciente y haciendo eco a la situación internacional, eh, hemos concentrado incluso más nuestros esfuerzos en que esta relación bilateral tome una dimensión al menos regional e internacional. Eh, nos hemos enfocado en particular en temas que son de alto impacto, como pueden ser las enfermedades emergentes, también puede ser el cambio climático y en especial la lucha contra las arribaciones masivas de sargazo, que me parecen un síntoma de muchas cosas que se están produciendo en términos de, de justamente de clima, y de impacto del hombre en el medio ambiente. 
eh, esta colaboración a escala ya transnacional tiene por objetivo hacer mucho más eficiente el uso de los recursos de los que disponemos, a la vez recursos humanos, recursos financieros, y también esto que es tan importante que mencionaba Dionisio, que es compartir. Compartir los resultados, compartir la información, compartir la pericia que tenemos para afrontar estos retos que son realmente globales. También eh, una de, de las ventajas será que esta estrategia nos permitirá acceder a financiamientos herramientas de financiamiento europeo e internacional, muy interesantes para todos los equipos eh, implicados. Como lo mencionaba Dionisio nuevamente, eh, pues la situación sanitaria, este contexto de pandemia que atravesamos, creo que ha puesto en evidencia la, la relevancia o lo esencial que es eh, tener esta colaboración internacional, desarrollar una investigación científica de calidad, que sea ambiciosa, que sea transdisciplinaria, pero sobre todo, Frente a las fake news y frente a un, varias situaciones que hemos encontrado, vemos que es sumamente importante no solo hacer esta investigación, sino comunicar de manera más eficiente los resultados de la misma, los conocimientos que tenemos, tanto a los tomadores de decisiones como al público en general. Y en este sentido, bueno, la Embajada de Francia está muy implicada en el desarrollo de programas, de comunicación científica, de diálogo, de debate y también de nuevas maneras de transmitir los conocimientos a través del arte, a través también de, de eventos con innovación tecnológica, como pueden ser hackatones u otro tipo de, de, de eventos. Pero en todo este marco ya un poquito más global, el intercambio tan nutrido que existe entre el Collège de France y el Colegio Nacional me parece sumamente importante. Eh, mis más sinceras felicitaciones a los organizadores eh, de este ciclo Universidades por la Ciencia, Obviamente, toda mi admiración a Bárbara Romanovic, que está presente con nosotros el día de hoy. Estoy tan impaciente como el público en ya escuchar su, su intervención y su conferencia. Así que les agradezco mucho su atención, su paciencia y les deseo una excelente tarde. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Sí, muchas gracias. Sí, este, eh, y adelante, please, eh, eh, go ahead, eh, Bárbara. Thanks very much again. Okay, well, thank you very much for this invitation and for the very nice presentation. I will try and share my screen um, to um, and uh, put it in full view. Okay, can you see it? Uh, can you see my presentation? Very well. Thank yes. You. Okay, so um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators um, and uh, former students who, uh, of course, did all the work that I will be presenting today. So first of all, my former students, uh, Lekic, French, Kotar, and Yuan, uh, collab recent and more recent collaborators, Williams, Mokopachai, and Rudolf at UC Davis, and Davai, Isabel Panet, and Marianne Graff, left uh, at IPG in Paris and um, the uh, Université Paris Sud Orsay. Um, and um, so uh, 50, we are 50 years after accepting the theory of plate tectonics. And we have a very general view of how plates move. And this cartoon, which is very outdated, shows the sort of rough idea of how the um, convective motions, the most very slow, sluggish motions in the Earth's mantle, move uh, the plates at the surface of the Earth, uh, creating uh, new material at ridges and um, um, uh, having sub, um, plates go da back down into the mantle uh, in subduction zones. Uh, however, this is, of course, a very simplistic view and uh, is um, uh, not really uh, very realistic. We have many questions still that uh, we would like to answer concerning this whole uh, engine. And in particular, what is uh, the source of the energy that moves the plates? Um, we know that some of it comes from primordial heat uh, and from heat that is being um, still um, uh, It, uh, uh, given out by the Earth's core from the time of the Earth's formation. We know that there are radioactive elements in the mantle that continue to produce heat. But what is exactly the proportion 
is still not very uh, very well constrained and this would, can manifest itself very differently for example if we are if the mantle is primarily internally heated by um, uh, by radioactive decay then we expect to see a certain plan form of convection with very thin sheets of downwellings and very diffuse upwellings, very diffuse upwellings in the convection. This is, of course, uh, what we may uh, think we see near the surface with the very thin uh, plate sheets that come down in the mantle. On the other hand, if mo a lot of the heat comes from the core, that we are in the case of a fluid which is heated from below and cooled from above, and then we expect to see so the so-called mantle plumes plumes of hot material, narrow plumes of hot material that rise from somewhere deep in the, in the earth uh, to the surface. We, um, there may be also uh, some uh, more complex structure to the convection, such as uh, secondary, what we would call secondary scale convection in the upper mantle, uh, as uh, can be seen in, a, in, a, uh, in fluids, and um, also uh, we uh, may have a complexity that the uh, um, the convection may not be driven solely by thermal um, by thermal differences by differences in temperature, but also composition may play a role, as we can see here in this uh, animation, which I can't uh, get to because of, uh, yes. So uh, as you can see here, um, I wanted to show this. Uh, this particular movie to, in particular, show you uh, this is just a simulation under under certain conditions. This is not the real Earth, and um, you can see that there are th something different is happening in the upper part of the mantle. So, what do we know about the internal structure of the Earth? Um, already for many decades, we have a very good uh, idea of the. Um, of the one, what we call the one-dimensional structure of the Earth, which is the uh, part which is spherically symmetric. The Earth is to a very good first order, uh, made up of concentric shells, the crust, the mantle, the, uh, the liquid outer core, made, up, made primarily of iron, and a solid small inner, inner core. And uh, confronting the results from seismology, which gives us the elastic parameters, uh, of the um, uh, of the um, materials as a function of depth from the surface to the to the center of the earth so two velocities shear velocity compressional velocity and and density and then uh, confronting that with mineral physics experiments uh, we have an idea of, of the average composition we also have from uh, geodetic measurements and from the study of elastic rebound uh, um, uh, due to the uh, uh, warming of the climate, uh, we have an idea that uh, the, um, the viscosity of the mantle, which is the characteristic which, uh, uh, which governs the, uh, the fluidity of, of, of the mantle or how fast it deforms, is, um, varies with depths and that uh, that uh, the, the mantle is more deformable in its upper parts uh, than in the lower, most lower mantle. And also the um, resolution is not very good. Usually uh, that transition from lower viscosity, um, more vigorous convection, to higher viscosity is put at around 660 kilometers depth, which corresponds to a crystalline phase transition in the um, uh, component, the olivine component of, of the man, man, mantle rock, uh, which uh, this phase transition being due to the increase in the pressure and temperature as you go deeper into the Earth. So this is our view of the Earth uh, maybe 40 years ago. Uh, since then, the um, technique of, of seismic tomography, which uses the um, uh, primarily the, uh, the travel times of seismic waves that travel through the Earth to back project and, and find out the, um, the velocity structure, the, the elastic velocity structure, the material properties of, of the rock at given locations, uh, has, given, uh, has allowed us to uh, produce uh, images of the Earth's interior 
at very large scales. And so I want to walk you through very quickly through uh, the kind of images that we uh, have become familiar with in the last uh, 10, uh, 15, maybe 20 years. Um, these, what I'm showing here, are maps of the shear velocity variations. So it's a material, local material property um, that uh, varies laterally, varies depending on the location you are uh, at, uh, at the surface of the Earth, but it varies in depth also. And so if we cut slices into the Earth, horizontal slices at different depths, we can see these variations, which are here represented with respect to an average at each depth. So this is a percent velocity. And um, here we have a map at 100 kilometers and, and then going deeper and deeper into the mantle. The way to look at these maps to first order is that if you see red, it means lower uh, shear velocities than the average global, the global average. It can be related to higher temperatures than the average. And then the blue is colder uh, than average, uh, uh, um, faster than average velocities. And if you look first at uh, the depth of 100 kilometers, it is quite striking that uh, you actually see the, the, basically this reflects plate tectonics. You see the ridge system, the mid-ocean ridge system uh, here uh, in the Pacific and then going into the Indian Ocean and then in the Atlantic which marks the, um, the, the places where new Earth, new uh, crust, new Earth crust is, is formed from the magma coming from in the interior of the Earth. And as you go, as the plate um, is uh, uh, kind of, as you move away from these ridges, you can see cooler and cooler colors, mean, which reflects the uh, cooling of the plate as it becomes older and moves away from the ridge and is replaced by newer, newer crust. What you see also is um, some red here in uh, the Western Pacific, which corresponds to the back arc regions of uh, where you have volcanism related to the subduction of plates. Here, the Pacific plate going back down into the mantle. And you can see also some blue uh, spots here uh, that mark the very old continents. Um, the very old parts of continents, uh, which are cold and also uh, somewhat different composition. So this uh, image essentially um, confirms the, uh, is one more confirmation of the uh, validity of the plate tectonic theory. However, as we go deeper into the mantle, you can see that the picture changes rapidly. Down, okay, so the mantle is 2,900 kilometers thick, and so now we are down to 600 kilometers, and you can see that the main features that you see are these areas of faster than average or colder than average um, material, which you can relate to the subducted slabs that come down into the mantle. And so to show this in another view, I'm uh, showing here two depth cross sections. So instead of the map view, we're now looking in depth into the mantle from the surface to the boundary with the liquid core. And you can see, um, sorry, uh, here, these uh, cross sections here in, um, in the Western Pacific region and here in South America, showing how these uh, subducted slabs, these cold subducted slabs, dive into deep into the mantle here all the way to 600 kilometers depth. This line here is about 660 kilometers depth. It's the boundary between the upper mantle and the lower mantle, the phase change uh, where the olivine gets decomposed into perovskite and oxide. And um, you, uh, if you go deeper, this changes still, but you still have some uh, strong uh, patches of blue which you can relate to uh, other subducted zones here in the Fiji Tonga area and here in northern part of South America. And what is most uh, remarkable is what happens when you get to the bottom of the mantle. This is 100 kilometers above the core mantle boundary, and the picture has changed completely. You do not see any relation with plate tectonics anymore, any no direct relation. You see two large regions of low shear velocity, 
one centered in the Pacific, one centered under Africa, which uh, are surrounded by a ring of fast velocities. We like to refer to this ring as the um, graveyard of slabs because it seems to coincide with the places where slabs um, enter, um, basically end up at the base of the mantle. These two regions have a very ugly name. They are called the large low shear velocity provinces. And, um, if, uh, and we will spend a little time on these. So uh, you also can see the differences as you go deep into the mantle in the scale length of heterogeneity that is found in the tomographic model. Uh, if you look at this spectrum, this uh, on the x-axis is um, going to smaller and smaller wavelengths, horizontal wavelengths. And what I want to point out is this strong energy, which is here indicated in the red color, at the base of the mantle in very long wavelengths, uh, the very, very long wavelengths, which we refer to as the degree two. And um, these uh, low shear, large low shear velocity provinces are seen in anybody's uh, tomographic model. They are not dependent on the method that you uh, use to uh, construct the seismic tomographic model. These are different groups. The details differ be between groups, but they are very well um, kind of constrained in, uh, in their large features. And if you filter the structure to its longest wavelengths and represent it here in a sort of quasi 3D manner with the axis of rotation here um, in the vertical direction, what you see is that these two large low shear velocity provinces are located um, sort of antipodally with respect to each other uh, and uh, centered on the equator. And that um, if you plot the paleo locations of the pole of the Earth's rotation, it, the last 250 years, it actually plots in this ring of fast velocities that separates these two regions. And this is first reminiscent of what you expect in a very simple convective system, so-called degree two convective system in a fluid, where you have two upwellings, these would be the uh, these uh, located in those large shear velocity zones, and then a ring of downwellings in the planet. And it also suggests that these large low shear velocity provinces may have been stable for at least the 250 million years of the data that we have uh, of the paleo locations of the um, of the rotation pole. So what are they? And what is their role in the dynamics of the mantle? Are they, do they play an important role? Uh, are they um, a thermal structure? How long have they been stable? And so if you take five, so let's look at them a little bit closer. If you take five different tomographic models and do this voting map, who thinks the velocity is lower than average Who uh, in a particular location? which uh, model thinks the velocity is uh, larger than average, faster than average. You get a very consistent picture uh, with uh, here again, this ring of fast velocities, but notice that the um, borders of these large low shear velocity provinces are quite well defined and very consistent among models. Most of them uh, see them, uh, the, you see five models see red, that is lower than average velocities in a very large region. And all five models think uh, or see the uh, ring of fast velocity as um, faster than average. And if you plot the average velocity as a function of depth in these two regions, in, in the red region and in the blue region, you see quite a different behavior, which points to possibly a difference in um, the actual composition of the large low shear velocity provinces here on this side compared to, say, these uh, very um, dominant uh, uh, region of uh, uh, ring of fast velocities. These uh, regions also have very sharp borders. Since I'm a seismologist, I can't help showing some seismograms, but this is a, a basically a, a record session. So you have seismograms here as a function of the distance of the station from 
uh, earthquakes in um, here in the Pacific observed in an array of stations in South Africa. And you can see, if you look at it as a function of distance of the observations, you see a sharp offset here uh, within a very short epicentral distance. This is the indication that the borders of this uh, large low shear velocity province, this particular one, which is the African one, is very sharp. There are other evidences. I will uh, not um, spend much time on this because of lack of time. And then recently, a controversy uh, arose. Because these large low shear velocity provinces or LLSVPs seem to may have been stable for a long time, uh, it seems that they may be denser than the surrounding ma uh, mantle. Otherwise, they would uh, sim very quickly disappear in the global circulations. Well, there was one study based on the um, analysis of uh, normal modes of the Earth, the uh, free oscillation, standing waves uh, on the Earth, that uh, suggested that actually these uh, LLSVPs are lighter than the surrounding material. On the other hand, another study about at the same time, uh, using completely different approach based on the analysis of Earth tides, found that, uh, or proposed that, in the contrary, the large low shear velocity provinces are denser than others. So what is it? What is the story? Um, going back to these voting maps, where you compare a certain number of models and see where they agree and where they disagree, um, two of my former students, Susanna Kotar and Ved Lekitz, produced a slightly more detailed um, kind of uh, view of the large low shear velocity province. And here uh, you see a map of the, uh, the world centered on the Pacific large low shear velocity province, and so we are deep in the mantle, uh, near the core mantle boundary. And here are uh, depth cross-sections of the same. But these are not real models. These are voting maps. How many models agree that the velocities are lower than average? You can see that based on these maps, you would think that these LLSVPs extend very high into the mantle, like at least uh, uh, 1,500 kilometers up above the core mantle boundary, which is here. This is depth. Uh, and they are very compact and broad. You can see it very well here in this cross-section DD prime that uh, goes north to south. And so uh, the, um, the impression from these maps is that you have some very compact, very large uh, features of lower than average velocity at the, uh, shear velocity at the base of the mantle. What you need to understand that these models, before they have been compared to make these maps, uh, have been filtered to long wavelengths. So if there is any internal structure in these features, you would not see it in these maps and in these cross sections. However, um, this has inspired a lot of work by geodynamicists, and in particular, this kind of work that I am sort of uh, just illustrating here from a, a, a recent, relatively recent study where uh, the, the geodynamicists have um, modeled the behavior uh, of a mantle uh, simulation uh, where the base of the mantle is made up of dense pile materials. And the dense piles are being swept around by the convective system. And this is what it looks like with these dense, very strong, very um, compact piles, on top of which you can see some upwelling, very thin, narrow, what we would call, call mantle plumes um, starting at the top of these piles. Uh, the sophistication in, in investigating these piles has been very large. And so uh, some authors have also proposed that they have some internal um, compositional structure uh, that is layered with uh, a bottom layer, which would be a made up of so-called primordial material, material that was deposited there uh, at the very beginning of uh, the formation of the Earth, and a um, more shallow, slightly lighter material that would have been brought from um, over the geological times 
from um, the uh, uh, deposition of subduction. So these, these are some models that are being proposed. And the question is, are these piles, are these LLSVPs really such piles, or are they uh, maybe um, something different? So um, uh, there is a lot of debate on this question. And uh, I borrowed this uh, cartoon from uh, work by uh, my colleague uh, Edgar Nero at uh, ASU, uh, Arizona State University, uh, who uh, very nicely uh, kind of uh, se sets the debate. Are the, are the um, LLSVPs stable domes, metastable piles with um, or stable piles with plumes rising from the borders of them? Or are they just a bundle of mantle plumes, which we cannot distinguish yet because of the um, poor resolution, poor uh, um, sharpness of our images? So uh, this brings me up, me to say a few words about uh, why we are so interested in mantle plumes. We are very interested in mantle plumes because we have evidence that um, volca volcanic lavas in so-called hotspot volcanoes, volcanoes that are in the middle of tectonic plates, as opposed to along mid-ocean ridges or um, in subduction zones, uh, that these hotspot volcanoes have different compositions of lavas, especially in trace uh, geochemical elements. So this is shown here. In a, in a typical geochemical plot showing one uh, system of uh, trace elements against another one, showing the distinct uh, pattern of hotspot volcanoes com compared to mid-ocean ridge basalts. Uh, another um, element uh, is the, um, uh, the helium in, uh, in these lavas, which uh, has a very different ratio of uh, radioactive helium-3 to helium-4, uh, which uh, where you can also distinguish very clearly the uh, intraplate volcanism, that is the hotspot volcanism, from the volcanism in spreading centers. And uh, where you see that ocean islands in the middle of plates have different uh, uh, composition. And the idea here is where is that coming from? Since mid-ocean ridges are sampling the uh, rather shallow mantle, uh, these hotspot volcanoes may be sampling a primordial, very old reservoir somewhere deep in the mantle. And so how, um, how would they be sampling there? Well, they might be sampling them through uh, the, uh, through the um, fact that beneath these hotspot volcanoes, we might have uh, uh, plumes, mantle plumes, plumes of hot material rising from maybe the base of the mantle, as was proposed uh, by um, uh, Jason Morgan in, in uh, the 1970s. And previously, the whole concept of mantle plume was proposed by Tuzo Wilson, one, one of the uh, giants of the plate tectonic theory in the 1960s. Uh, and these plumes may be sampling a deep, deep uh, reservoir and bringing these, this unusual material to the surface uh, at the hotspot uh, volcanoes. So the quest for mantle plumes has been, in uh, seismic tomography, has been going on for a long time. The problem is resolution is challenging. Uh, this is a, a remarkable effort of uh, trying to resolve the deep structure beneath the islands of Hawaii. Hawaii is a typical um, island, island um, uh, mid-plate mid, uh, mid, uh, uh, island uh, hotspot volcano with um, uh, the currently active um, volca volcano on the east side and then progressively older volcanism, um, uh, extinct volcanism as, as you go in the direction of the motion of the Pacific plate. So it seems like this hotspot volcano could be under um, uh, under this hotspot volcano, there might be a mantle plume uh, that is fixed with respect to the motion of the plate over time. But if you do standard so-called travel time tomography, uh, you, it is very difficult to have a large enough aperture, even if you put um, ocean bottom seismometers 
around the island, as was done in this experiment by a group um, led by uh, um, Cecily Wolf, uh, which um, uh, because uh, you you can see the geometry is that the ray pass of seismic waves um, in your small region uh, do cross only up down to a certain depth. This crossing of ray pass is an essential um, component of resolution in tomographic models. And so if the ray pass do not cross, if you do not have crossing ray pass, you can smear the structure that you are inferring, that you are back projecting. You can smear, you can, um, smear it along the ray pass, and in fact, it could be coming from some other part of the Earth. So in this, in this um, cross section, as you can see, the, um, uh, the images that were obtained here in map view at 200 kilometers and 900 kilometers, and here in depth cross sections from the surface, to uh, 2,000 kilometers depth, so, pro so almost um, at the core mantle boundary. And you can see this very strong feature of low velocity, so high temperatures, right beneath the islands, uh, surrounded by some fast velocities. And as you go deeper, you kind of see an extension of uh, low velocities, which you, um, you might ex um, uh, interpret as uh, the evidence for the presence of a plume. But because of these issues with resolution, the, um, uh, this kind of studies has been met with some criticism. Uh, the other problem with travel time tomography is that, in fact, if you have narrow plumes, they may be hidden from view. Because as the waves propagate from an earthquake to a station and go through this low velocity body, in fact, the first arriving wave does not go through the body because it slows it down. It actually goes around it. So if you only measure the first arriving wave, the time of propagation of the first arriving wave, you will miss the low velocity body. So in order to see it fully, you need to look at an entire waveform. You need to dig into the coda of the, of the wave you are observing. And so this, uh, this was first uh, proposed by um, uh, Husnole and uh, Tony Dallon at Princeton University, who introduced uh, a method to, to include what's called finite frequency kernels in travel time tomography. And they made some beautiful pictures of what looks like maybe mantle plumes below some of the major hotspot uh, volcanoes, such as, sorry, such as Hawaii, um, uh, Kerguelen, here uh, in the South Pacific, Pacific region. Um, but again, uh, these pictures uh, were met with some skepticism because of the resolution issue, and also because these plumes, you had to believe in them, to follow them uh, you know, vertically, say, uh, throughout the mantle. So, um, however, we have uh, the ability to uh, use more than just the travel times of first arriving waves. Uh, seismograms that represent the uh, registration, the recording of uh, large earthquakes as observed uh, around the whole Earth record many waves that have bounced around the interior of the Earth in many, in many places. And if you can use all of these waves, you have a better illumination of the interior of the Earth. And this has led to the development of um, so-called waveform tomography, where instead of measuring travel times of individual wave arrival, individual arrivals of energy, you use the whole seismogram and compare it uh, to a reference seismogram computed in um, an, an Earth model that you happen to have, the best possible Earth model that you have. And then you try to interpret the differences between these um, synthetics, these the synthetic wave field, and your uh, actual waveforms. Now, this took a while to develop because you have to be able to compute the wave field accurately in an Earth with a complex three-dimensional structure. In the early days, we used the normal mode theory to do this. But recently, in the last 10 years, 
we have much more powerful um, methods based on numerical integration of the equations of motions that govern the motions of the of the waves. And uh, so we are able to do this uh, much more accurately. I will spare you the details of the techniques, but just show you uh, what um, you know these uh, new uh, modeling techniques have enabled us to see um, uh, in the deep mantle. And so here I'm just showing some examples of what we now see beneath um, some of the most prominent uh, hotspot volcanoes, which are indicated here as uh, green triangles. And so what I'm showing here, each of these is a depth cross section from the surface to the core mantle boundary, to the limit with the liquid core, so throughout the mantle, in uh, different regions, across different regions, which are indicated by these lines in these, um, in these little maps. And so here, for example, you have, we are crossing, uh, we are, uh, have a, a swath of the Earth, crossing three um, volcanic centers, uh, Samoa, Tahiti, and the Marquesas in the Southern Pacific. And we see three big, um, uh, three large um, structures uh, that are separated from each other that rise from the core mantle boundary into the mantle, and that seem to end up uh, narrowing down in the upper part of the mantle and end up close to, um, at least in the vicinity of these volcanic centers. Uh, here is another example in the Pacific near the McDonald volcano. And here are some examples in uh, the, um, uh, above the African superplume or the African LLSVP, which also shows very similar behavior. And these features, uh, you will notice um, this is like uh, half of the circumference of the Earth. And at the base, you do not see any continuous, very large, uh, low velocity region. You really see a more focused um, um, uh, up, well, lower than average uh, feature, which of course uh, we tend to interpret uh, as at first order as an upwelling, as a region of lower than average um, velocity and therefore temperature and therefore upwelling. And uh, so these were, this is a model that we um, uh, derived uh, um, already a couple of years ago. More recently, other groups have confirmed these features. This is a very recent model by the group in Princeton uh, who have used similar techniques, but, uh, but not quite the same. Uh, there are, the devil is in the details of the way you do the inversion, the tomographic inversion. And they, um, the, again, the details of the models um, differ, but you see here in, under Cape Verde, you see a very similar structure. You see its deflection towards um, in the upper mantle. It's not in the lower mantle. It's not right under the hotspot uh, in both models. Here is the case of Iceland showing similar features. Um, and um, now let's go back to uh, what we see at the base of the mantle. I was telling you about those large low shear velocity provinces. In our recent model, these large low shear velocity provinces uh, have some structure, some internal structure that don't look very compact. But the other remarkable uh, thing about this is that most of the structures that we see, these large columns that we can refer to as plumes, uh, they all are based inside the large low shear velocity provinces. These are the black dots that you see here and some of the gray dots. Some other hotspots uh, that are indicated by, blue, by green uh, do not have any corresponding features in our model. This may be due to the fact that either they don't have a deep root or because we cannot resolve those deep roots. But certainly there is something special about these um, uh, very lar large columns that are, seem to all be rooted in the uh, large low shear velocity provinces. Another interesting um, um, feature of this uh, for the geochemists is that uh, we can trace back the uh, volcanoes that have a very, that have a um, helium anomaly, the, those of the hotspot that have helium anomaly, trace back to the base of the mantle also in the large low shear velocity provinces. I don't have time to, to look at this in detail, unfortunately, so let's just skip this. 
So what about these large low shear velocity provinces? If we filter them, if we only extract the longest wavelengths, we found we find them very much like uh, we saw them in the models that were developed before the advent of these uh, numerical techniques for um, full waveform tomography. Uh, and we can show that uh, the fact that they seem to be um, made up, have a very finer structure, is not an artifact because we can do some synthetic tests where we put in a very compact, large pile at the base of the mantle. This is in depth cross section. This is as viewed uh, in uh, map view. And we run it through what we call a resolution test, a uh, synthetic resolution test that mimics the procedure that we use for our inversion. And if we do that, we see that we recover them at compact features. We lose some of the amplitude, which is a common um, issue with, uh, uh, with the tomographic inversion, but we still see them as compact features. So I will now lead you very quickly through uh, some cross sections through the Pacific Ocean and also on the Atlantic side. What we're going to be looking at is maps um, here in the left showing the location of the cross sections, depth cross sections seen here, which go from the surface to the core mantle boundary. The, the broken lines are at 400, 660 kilometers, which are the two uh, well-known discontinuities in the upper mantle, and then at a thousand kilometers depth for reference, because something seems to be changing at a thousand kilometers depth, where we have no reason to think that there is a phase change or any other material change in the mantle, at least uh, until today. We start um, beneath the Caroline hotspot, which is here, and you can see this large feature uh, uh, extending throughout uh, the mantle. When we move a little bit to the east, we are now in the middle of this large patch of, uh, of the large low shear velocity province. But you can see in cross section that in fact, the structure does not extend very high. It doesn't extend more than three or 400 kilometers above the component boundary. And if you take into account the smearing involved in the tomographic image, tomographic image is not completely sharp, uh, these are very, very, um, uh, they, this feature, this very low velocity feature, does not extend high above the mantle. You see a halo of low velocity, but very small um, uh, anomaly, very small uh, feature, uh, very um, weak feature. As we move closer to hotspots like Samoa, which is here, and Hawaii, which is here, you can start seeing these halos of these um, of these volcanoes. Something, a signature of these plumes related to these two um, two hotspot uh, volcanoes. Uh, if we get closer, you see them better, and even closer, you see the a signature of the Hawaiian mantle plume, which rises very straight in the lower mantle, but then seems to meander in the upper mantle before it reaches the hotspot at Hawaii and something similar in Samoa. Note the signature of the subducting slabs here in, in, the, in, in uh, Fiji Tonga. Here it's Indonesia and here is Fiji Tonga, which has reached a depth of in excess of a thousand kilometers um, in this particular location. Uh, you see similar features in the Atlantic hemisphere. Here we see uh, some um, evidence of plumes be below uh, the uh, hotspot of Tristan and Cameroon. And um, moving further to the east, uh, you see them even clearer. And if you want to interpret them as I would like to, this is uh, the idea we are coming up with. Uh, perhaps this one, which is off, not in the right cross section, so we're only seeing uh, part of it. And moving further east, you see that even more clearly. Uh, and perhaps an interpretation would, might look like this. And finally, this in this picture, um, you see also separate features that we hope in the future to be able to resolve more clearly. Um, resolution tests show in, in these two, two of the last cross sections I showed, um, the resolution showed that if you put a compact uh, LLSVP extending high into the mantle, you would recover it as compact. On the other hand, if you put in um, some uh, very strong 
probably exaggerated structures, separated structures, you, you would resolve them somewhat. So um, there are other studies that seem to indicate that the, the African anomaly is not a single uh, compact structure, that there is a gap in the middle. And um, so finally, um, I think uh, this leaves us with the idea that probably what uh, those uh, LLSVPs uh, represent are not really uh, compact piles that are being swept around at the base of the mantle, but more like a bundle of mantle plumes. I guess I should probably stop here because um, I'm running out of time, but I'll be happy to continue if you think uh, the, there is time or whatever. I can uh, I'll continue walking you through uh, the mantle and, uh, and uh, showing more results. But I think maybe uh, this is a good place to stop. What do you think, Jaime? Well, it's really interesting, and as you wish, we can take some questions now, or or we will be happy if you continue. For it's... another maybe uh, ten minutes is not too much, or five ten minutes. Um, yeah, it sounds good. Yes, five ten minutes will be okay. okay. So maybe I'll skip some. Yes. So this <laughs> basically the proposed model. Uh, there are other feature, interesting features in these structures. For example, the fact that they seem to be rooted in very, very low uh, velocity structures. The contrast here is very dark red, so very hot, or maybe compositionally different. And there is evidence that, in fact, beneath, in the center of these roots, there might be so-called, what we call ultra-low velocity zones, ULVZs. These are very, very unusual structures, which um, correspond to very extreme properties of material, velocity reductions of 20 or 25 percent, whereas on average we expect these velocity reductions in standard uh, mantle materials to be only a few percent. In this particular case in Hawaii, uh, we, uh, we found by a, um, a different study of a student of mine, Zanakota, that we needed an ultra low velocity um, zone of, of thickness of about 20 kilometers above the core mantle boundary and a diameter of uh, close to a thousand kilometers. So a large feature, but not very high above the mantle of very extreme velocity reduction. And the question is, uh, you know, we didn't discover these, uh, the existence of ultra low velocity zones that was done uh, much earlier uh, by uh, Garnero and Hendroger. Uh, in the 1990s, but the discovery of these very large uh, low, ultra low velocity zones uh, poses the question as for other such structures is what, what are they made of? They could be made of solid iron because iron has very low shear velocities and high density, but they also could um, indicate the presence of partial melt. And we prefer the version of partial melt because a study of ours in, um, in Iceland. Uh, uh, we actually showed that this ultra low velocity zone has to be almost circular in um, in shape, which points uh, more likely to the presence to them being due to basically a phase change from partial melt to solid uh, that would be more easily accommodated in a quasi spherical cylindrical kind of geometry. Uh, the other th the other feature is that these plumes are not your standard very thin plumes that you see in a thermal uh, uh, model where everything is driven by temperature, uh, contrast between a hot boundary at the bottom and a cold boundary at the top. They are very wide. They are at least four to 600 kilometers wide, probably maybe more. Um, we wouldn't see them otherwise. And if they were very thin, we, in order to see them, they would have extreme uh, properties all along the way, which is quite unlikely. In particular, you have contrast in temperature exceeding a thousand or fifteen hundred degrees, which uh, has is is very likely unknown from the analysis of uh, the lavas in uh, hotspot volcanoes. So they must be uh, compositionally 
um, also they must involve some comp entrainment of dense material and this is just a, an example from a lab experiment uh, from Andavai's group showing the different shapes of thermochemical plumes depending on how much the density contrast is at the base of the mantle in this layer that they are sampling. And so this uh, led us to come up with uh, this kind of ugly cartoon. Uh, it's ugly because of the color, I think, uh, kind of indicating that most likely the lower mantle, but lower mantle defined as um, separated at about a thousand kilometers, not the 660 kilometers that we usually think of as being the limit between the lower and the upper mantle, with a very, very sluggish lower mantle with almost not moving, with these bundles of plumes um, kind of um, rooted in these ultra low velocity zones and um, rising upward and then changing um, there's a change around a thousand kilometers depth into a region of um, more vigorous convection that deflects the plumes. They are not deflected much by what's called the mantle wind in the lower mantle, but they look like they might be deflected and thinner in the upper mantle. So to finish, I just want to show you why this cartoon, um, I don't have time to talk about the upper mantle and some features that we are seeing now also. Um, um, kind of pointing to the presence of some secondary scale convection in the upper mantle. But let me just show you um, very briefly why, um, why this uh, contrast at a thousand kilometers. The thousand kilometers depth, you see these deflections in our, our figures, and also you lose some of the plumes or they become much narrower. And this is very reminiscent of what you observe in laboratory experiments or numerical experiments, as shown here, when you have a, a plume, a thermochemical plume here, um, encountering a strong viscosity contrast. In this figure, the viscosity contrast is at 660 kilometers, but in fact, there seems to be something going at a thousand kilometers, as seen by these plumes, and also as seen by the subducted slabs ponding at these depths, as I showed at the beginning of, of the presentation. Again, I should stop here. Um, the, I don't have time to talk about the upper mantle, but let's, let me leave you with this cartoon, which um, is sort of a schematic interpretation of our present um, uh, mantle um, tomographic images. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Barbara. It's uh, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and uh, very interesting how you can uh, look inside the earth. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing uh, uh, study. Uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, questions uh, uh, and thanks very much uh, uh, for the interest and for sending these uh, questions and comments. Um, I will uh, uh, read uh, some of them. Uh, um, and uh, for the uh, first is uh, uh, congratulations, uh, an interesting study. And uh, uh, how long do plumes take uh, to, to rise? And uh, if uh, they contain uh, material from the core, what is oh, the like scale of plumes? Very good question. So we think of the um, overturn times in the upper mantle, right? The circulation until being several tens of millions of years. In the lower mantle, it's probably about, uh, you know, more several hundred million years, uh, slower, uh, slower um, motions. And uh, for, you know, for the overturn time. And the plumes in there may, uh, will likely take only, a, a, you know, a couple million years, probably, to rise from the base of the mantle. Uh, and the second question was uh, about whether they could contain material from the core. I'm glad you asked the question, because, um, in fact, um, the studies, I haven't really gone into the details, but um, uh, the fact that this primordial material that is um, uh, detected in the hotspot volcanoes, uh, that we can track it to the base of the mantle, to these very large 
through these very large um, columns, um, or very wide columns, very wide plumes, that some of them contain these ultra low velocity zones. For now, we only have four examples uh, of large ultra low velocity zones beneath plumes. We have one in Iceland, one in Hawaii, one in Samoa, and most recently in a, in a recent study um, uh, under the Marquesas, there seems to be also a very large ultra low velocity zone. But one can ask the question if the primordial material is concentrated in the ultra low velocity zones. Is this, um, you know, a, a manifestation of something that has been there for since the beginning, since the Earth was formed, or are these plumes tapping the core, right? And this, of course, um, you know, relates to controversies among geochemists about uh, whether, you know, where the um, anomalous uh, isotopic signatures may come from, whether they come from primordial mantle or from the core. But in my view, um, it's an open question, and it's not uh, impossible that they are just tapping the core. Hmm. Well, uh, do we have uh, samples from the mantle? What type of rocks uh, make the mantle? So we have samples of rocks uh, at mid-ocean ranges. Uh, at the places where the new crust is formed, we have uh, samples of the upper mantle, uh, which uh, is, are made up of peridotites. Uh, the main uh, mineral is olivine, uh, more or less 50%. And then um, uh, uh, there is some garnet and, um, uh, uh, and, and other, other constituents. But we also have... Uh, so this would be like in the oceans. We're tapping the upper mantle under the oceans. And this is what is used as a reference for the composition of, of the mantle. We also have, uh, can sample mantles in um, uh, kimberlites, right, in, uh, in the continents, which gives us some idea of composition beneath uh, old continents, beneath the oldest part of continents. But, uh, but on average, we get most of our information from the rocks sampled at mid-ocean ridges. And oh. olivine is the main constituent, uh, which is the, the mineral that, uh, um, that uh, undergoes uh, phase transitions to, to um, more and more packed uh, crystal structures. As we go deeper to higher pressure and temperatures, uh, you from, go from uh, one first structure, you go to a um, the so-called olivine structure to spinel, uh, and then from spinel you go to decomposition to oxides and perovskites at 660 kilometers depth, which has been confirmed from mineral physics experiments and is confirmed from seismology because we can detect the discontinuities as being very sharp in seismic waves. We see conversions and reflections from these discontinuities. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Anna, Anna Cecilia Elizalde asks uh, if uh, uh, processes uh, uh, on the surface uh, influence uh, in the mantle, uh, including uh, the human uh, activity. Uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, the human activities don't really um, influence the interior of the Earth very deep. In fact, uh, even the temperature profile, if you go just a couple hundred meters below the surface, you lose the influence of, of man, right? Of, for example, you can see the in, in the temperature profiles, as you go deep into the deeper, as you drill into the Earth, you see the influence of, of heating, uh, by, um, you know, like uh, in big cities, you see that influence, but below a kilometer's depth or even uh, less, uh, what you see is primarily uh, comes from the internal uh, heat. Yes. Hmm. Um, Marcela Elizalde asks uh, uh, about uh, the supercontinent, uh, the Pangaea. How was the mantle? in Pangaea. Aha, 
Well, <laughs> so this brings up, uh, I, don't, I unfortunately don't have any slides prepared to show this, but um, uh, this brings up a, uh, a recent study by Xavier Le Pichon uh, uh, and collaborators who have pointed out that in the time of Pangea, well, it brings up this study and also studies by um, uh, the, the group uh, in Oslo, um, uh, um, uh, Torsvik and others, uh, uh, and Kevin Burke, uh, who have done reconstructions of, uh, of the continent and have shown that the, um, uh, the borders of uh, of the um, that when they can reconstruct uh, Pangea in particular, uh, they end up uh, uh, with having the um, uh, the the current uh, large Lushi Verosity provinces coincide with the borders of the large of where you see the lips, the large igneous provinces. And uh, Xavier Le Pichon wrote recently a paper. Uh, Kind of suggesting that the position of the African large Lushi velocity provinces influence uh, how uh, you know the the continents moved, uh, in particular in the case of the formation of Pangaea. So there may actually be a, a, a strong relationship between the lowermost mantle structures and uh, the um, uh, and the continental you know, dispersal and, uh, and recombination into supercontinents. Uh, you know, what I'm saying today, what, what I told you about today is not incompatible, what I'm, uh, but I, um, I want people to realize that we don't, um, that uh, seismic resolution has not been good enough uh, until recently to really see the details of the structures, and you could still have an influence on the continents, even if uh, the LLSVPs are not compact, but made up of a bundle of, of plumes, it's still um, concentrated regions of hot material. Oh. Okay. Uh, well, it, it, thanks uh, for the, the questions. Uh, uh, I, um, well, we, we ap apologize uh, for not uh, taking all of them, but uh, we will try to send them to, to Barbara and uh, make uh, some comments uh, online. Uh, I will just uh, read uh, one more, and it's uh, 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 if uh, the Earth's uh, rotation has an influence in the mantle. OK, so that's also a very good question. I showed at the beginning of my presentation that um, I actually didn't mention it, so thanks for bringing this up. That if you look at the LLSVPs, uh, maybe I can quickly uh, go back to that um, figure uh, here. If you look at the very longest wavelengths, uh, you see this very uh, special pattern, which um, with the two LLSVPs equatorially located, antipodal, and uh, surrounded by this ring of fast velocities. This is actually a uh, stable configuration with respect to the moments of inertia of the Earth. So you might think that this corresponds to, um, you know, to something that has to do with the rotation of the Earth. Nowadays, the mantle is too viscous for rotation to have any influence. But way back, uh, when the Earth's mantle was being formed, we have this notion that at some point there was a magma ocean at the base uh, in the deep mantle. And at that time, the, um, the viscosity uh, would have, could have been much lower, so that rotation would have played a role and maybe would have led to basically freezing these structures in this, in this um, configuration. But this is just a, you know, a hypothesis. Today, it's not possible to think that the Earth's rotation um, really influences the motions in the deep mantle just because of the very large viscosity. Oh, okay. Well, thanks uh, very much. And uh, there are uh, several uh, messages just saying hello and congratulations. 
and uh, a comment by Javier Piedad. Uh, uh, on the importance of the international collaboration and uh, what uh, we can do with uh, France. So, uh, Javier, this is actually one of priorities. Uh, and, um, uh, we have a um, um, uh, actually a very large number of Congratulations uh, from uh, many different places, including uh, well, several places here in Mexico, uh, in uh, uh, Guerrero, in uh, Yucatan, and uh, we have uh, one from the uh, Technical University of uh, Loja in, uh, in uh, Ecuador. Uh, so, uh, well, thanks uh, and uh, very best uh, wishes uh, uh, from us. And, Thank you very uh, much. Uh, muchas gracias. <laughs> muchas gracias, uh, Barbara. Uh, thanks. And uh, well, the, the Earth is um, the only planet in the solar system with plate tectonics. And uh, we, we think that uh, this makes uh, Earth uh, well, very unique. Um, so muchas, uh, muchas gracias uh, a todos. Y muchas gracias también a la Embajada de, de, de Francia en uh, México de, por... Uh, el apoyo en eh, la colaboración con el Collège de France. Eh, thanks eh, to the eh, French, eh, to the embassy, eh, in, eh, to the French embassy in Mexico. And uh, eh, eh, we invite you to eh, join us eh, next eh, week. Eh, we have eh, a, a seminar on the, the giant eh, crystals eh, from eh, North Mexico. These are eh, huge eh, gypsum crystals. Uh, more than uh, 12 uh, meters uh, long by uh, Juan Emanuel uh, Garcia Ruiz uh, from the University of uh, Granada. Uh, la siguiente semana tenemos una conferencia sobre los cristales gigantes, uh, uh, de los cuales los más grandes están en México, en Chihuahua, en la mina de Naica, uh, que lleva uh, 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 compañía Fresnillo y Piñoles. Y eh, está a cargo de eh, Juan Manuel García Ruiz de la Universidad de Granada. Y les invitamos también a todas las actividades que desarrollamos en conjunto eh, con la Fundación UNAM, el Colegio eh, Nacional y las eh, universidades, el consorcio Universidades por la, por la Ciencia. Eh, agradecemos también eh, el apoyo de la Asociación Nacional de Universidades ANUYES y eh, eh, les eh, invitamos y les agradecemos a ustedes el interés a que nos continúen apoyando. Eh, thanks eh, very much eh, again, eh, Barbara. Uh, really interesting eh, research eh, and eh, interesting how we can look inside our eh, planet. Eh, and eh, eh, le pasamos la palabra a nuestro presidente de Fundación UNAM y este... Saludamos también a nuestra directora ejecutiva, Araceli Rodríguez. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Jaime. No sé si Valeria, que nos está acompañando en esta ocasión, pues quisiera hacer algún comentario sobre el contenido mismo de la presentación de la doctora Bárbara Romanovich o, o sobre pues un poquito lo, lo que significa de enormes ventajas este esfuerzo que estamos haciendo, pues si quisiera hacernos algún comentario, pues encantado, ¿sí? Se tuvo que retirar, doctor. Ah, ok, perfecto. Pues muchas gracias de nuevo, agradecemos mucho esta presentación, y la verdad es que celebramos, pues casi el doble, el doble propósito que estamos teniendo con, con esta, esta forma de compartir investigaciones. Esto nos enseña mucho de nuestro planeta, y yo tengo la impresión de que mucho de lo que estamos conociendo pues es fruto de investigaciones muy recientes, de investigaciones en curso. Y la verdad es que lo que nosotros hemos venido aprendiendo es que mucho de lo que se sabe hoy, pues se sabe fruto de investigaciones muy, muy recientes. Y yo creo que tenemos que celebrar pues, que estemos viviendo este momento tan formidable. Al mismo tiempo, mencionaba Jaime que tenemos escuchas de muchas partes, no solamente del país, sino de, del mundo. Y esto es fruto de que el consorcio pues, nos está permitiendo compartir, como ahora, 
con una gente que, que de esta especialidad de la Universidad de Berkeley, tuvimos la semana pasada de Tucson con el, la parte de, la, de sus vínculos con la universidad, la próxima tenemos una presentación de la Universidad de Granada y justamente esto está ilustrando, ya tuvimos también del área de neurobiología de nuestra propia Universidad de Juriquilla, entonces toda esta suma y toda esta diversidad de participantes y de escuchas enriquece la realización de, de estas presentaciones y nos permite conocer más y mejor este planeta en el que estamos viviendo. Hoy sabemos mucho más que antes de la presentación que nos hizo la doctora Bárbara. Muchísimas gracias por eso y sabemos más de la Tierra y seguramente en una próxima presentación nos dará una eh, información, información similar de lo que hay en Marte porque ahora ya parece ser que esa es el, la nueva frontera de nuestra investigación. Muchas gracias de nuevo a todos, eh, les agradecemos su presencia y los convocamos a que nos sigan acompañando en estas reuniones la próxima semana. Ahí está la doctora Valeria, ¿verdad? Ya llegó. Ah, sí, pues queríamos preguntarte si tenías algún comentario antes de concluir, pues eh, habiendo visto ya un poco el contenido de la presentación de la doctora Bárbara Romanovich y también pues un poquito el formato. Que, que con tu presencia hoy se enriquece. Adelante, doctor. Valery, adelante. Sí, este, una, una disculpa, estaba siguiendo la, la intervención de Bárbara por Facebook, así también pude ver que toda la transmisión funcionó muy bien. Muchísimas Muchísimas gracias por, por esta presentación, es eh, sumamente interesante. Me parece, parece, eh, un momento. Sí, estoy en un segundo porque lo estamos acabando. Su micrófono, Valeria. Está ¿Ahora sí? Sí. Una disculpa. Entonces retomo. Eh, perdón por el detalle técnico. Eh, sí, muchísimas gracias por la presentación. Son temáticas que se me hacen, eh, desde mi punto de vista científico, obviamente fascinantes, pero creo que también resulta, como lo comentábamos antes de iniciar la sesión, eh, extremadamente importante compartir lo más que se pueda todo este tipo de conocimientos eh, tal vez para algunas personas la investigación básica sea inaccesible o no sea útil <risa> hacia primera vista. Y creo que presentaciones como esta nos demuestran no solo que cualquiera que sea nuestra área, cualquiera que sea nuestro background, nuestro nivel, podemos eh, captar lo que nos están compartiendo. También esto requiere muchísimo talento. Muchísimas gracias, Bárbara. Eh, transmitir los conocimientos no es cosa fácil. Pero este tipo de demostraciones creo que pueden a la vez eh, mostrarnos eh, qué es la investigación, cuáles son los conocimientos que se están eh, ahorita, actualmente, como decía hace ratito Dionisio, que se está, investigación que se está haciendo actualmente, qué se está generando, creo que puede a la vez eh, provocar eh, vocaciones científicas, que eso lo espero de todo corazón, eh, provocar el entusiasmo del público joven que nos está viendo y en los demás que no sean del área científica, pues nutrir esta curiosidad, eh, nutrir también este, tal vez, eh, no quiero decir respeto, pero esta como consideración hacia el conocimiento, entender de dónde vienen las cosas que nos dicen luego en las noticias, entender que hay todo un trabajo detrás de cada uno de los resultados científicos que se pueden presentar en medios, y en este sentido creo que este tipo de, de ciclos y de acciones son sumamente importantes, sin contar que vienen también a reforzar, obviamente, la colaboración eh, pues, entre Francia y México, que abarca esta área científica, pero también muchas, muchas otras áreas, también en el área cultural, en el área artística. Entonces, nada más me queda... Toda nuevamente admiración, respeto hacia Bárbara. Muchísimas gracias a los organizadores por esta iniciativa y ya saben que cuentan con la embajada para poder seguir eh, impulsando iniciativas como estas y fomentando este tipo de colaboraciones. 
Eh, muchas, eh, muchas gracias. Y eh, mandamos también todos nuestros saludos a los eh, colegas en, en los eh, centros de investigación y a las universidades francesas y sobre todo al College, College de, de France. Eh, muchas gracias a la embajada. Y eh, thanks uh, again, uh, Barbara. A pleasure uh, uh, seeing you. And uh, we look forward for uh, visiting uh, you uh, and uh, the friends in the College de France in Paris. Yes, absolutely. Hopefully. Thank you, everybody. Muchas gracias a todos. Uh, my Spanish is not good enough to speak, but I understand it. Um, and uh, I also uh, wanted to say that I visited uh, UNAM uh, six years ago, five years ago, and, uh, and keep very uh, fond uh, memories and uh, also hope to be able to visit in person someday again. <laughs> but uh, we'll be very happy to see you all in, uh, at Collège de France. Well, thanks, and uh, bye, and uh, adieu. So I should stay on, or what? Do you want me to stay on now? Or yes, just yes, uh, okay. a few minutes. Thank okay. you. Uh, muchas gracias, Valerie. Thanks very much. Uh, Merci infiniment, Barbara. Professor Melade. Yeah. Merci à tous. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci. Cartelera del Colegio Nacional. En vivo. Organismos constitucionales autónomos. El manto de la tierra. Presentación editorial. Ensayos reunidos. 1984-1998. Las grandes piedras de la prehistoria. Temas pendientes en cuidados paliativos. La educación superior, las grandes instituciones nacionales. Y además te recomendamos. De la gran explosión al surgimiento de las civilizaciones. Del 22 al 27 de febrero. El Colegio Nacional te invita.
Cartelera del Colegio Nacional. En vivo. Organismos constitucionales autónomos. El manto de la tierra. Presentación editorial. Ensayos reunidos. 1984-1998. Las grandes piedras de la prehistoria. Temas pendientes en cuidados paliativos. La educación superior, las grandes instituciones nacionales. Y además te recomendamos. De la gran explosión al surgimiento de las civilizaciones. Del 22 al 27 de febrero. El Colegio Nacional te invita.
Cartelera del Colegio Nacional. En vivo. Organismos constitucionales autónomos. 